Bogart, who is one of the great, great figures in American theatre, an extraordinary director, um, wonderful writer, professor at Columbia. Um, I know many of you will have read about him and have worked for the City Company. We're very honoured here at Amsterdam City to have presented much of their work over the past few years. Um, she's a, a person of great generosity, staggering intelligence. Um, I'm happy that she's around. I think the world of her and Bogart.
something after me. And, and so I was giving this highly intellectual talk.
9-11 happened, a lot of things happened, and suddenly we came to the end of deconstruction, where we deconstructed so much that nothing means anything anymore. And faced with that, you have to ask, what is what comes after postmodernism? And the clues I have is, has something to do with stories. It has something to do with asking the question, whose stories? Who are they for? How do we tell them? And that's a big, wide open question, and it's one that everybody in this room has to figure out. I think there are pioneers in the world who are telling stories in a new way. Certainly, Chuck Me is telling a story in a new way. I think uh, Tectonic Theater, Moises Kaufman, is telling stories in a new way. I think that Anna DeBeer Smith is telling stories in a new way. Yeah. <laughs> In other words, whose stories and how do we tell them? The civilians. I think there are, are there's ways of telling stories, and that that. But the, going back to the issue of storytelling as a heroic act, it's hard to tell stories well. It takes a certain organization of spirit, and you all are studying Plato, right? <laughs> no. All right. For one person in the audience, I'm going to tell a little bit the story of Plato. Because of, you know the story of Plato's cave? Everybody's yeah. my favorite. <laughs> but it has to do with heroism, I think. Which is, I'll, I'll do it really briefly. I have a lot of points to go to before 11 30. You can get my book if I don't get through everything. <laughs> so, the, the, the metaphor is there's a bunch of people who are chained together inside of a cave, facing the back of the cave. In front of them is a wall and a fire behind that wall, and so the where that's behind them. Anyway, how does it work, lighting designers, that the shadows <coughs> of these people who are chained but is playing up against the wall, much like what, looking at the internet? That's, uh, <laughs> and so they're all chained <laughs> and looking at the walls and seeing their own reflections in the form of shadows and saying that's reality. And the story is there's one person, I think it could be a woman, play or <laughs> Somehow, and I can't remember how, gets unchained. So she's sitting there with these people who are looking at their reflections. He turns around and walks out of the cave into the sunlight. For the first time, nobody's seen sunlight, nobody's seen mountains, nobody's seen, it's just a story. Nobody's seen uh, the sky, and he sees, uh, she, she sees, uh, change your habit, uh, he sees trees, my God, trees and sky, and it's extraordinary. And what this person does, and it's what makes this person a hero, is she turns away from the trees and the sky and walks back down into the dark, goes to the front of the people who are chained, looking at their own shadows, and starts going, guys, you don't understand. There's trees out there. This, this has got the blue color, whatever this person says. And the people who are chained go, you're crazy. You're making strange gesticulations. <laughs> now, in Plato's story, what makes that person a hero is the fact that she turned and walked back into the cave and tried to describe in front of the disbelieving what this other <laughs> experience was. That is our job. Our job is to look like mad people. <laughs> Gesticulating in front of the unbelieving, what's the word? Unbelieving, disbelieving, disbelieving. All right. So, if, if, why, why I tell stories? That's one thing is to make bridges. Two stories can create memory and identity. You know, uh, you know Tasmania. You know where that is? Yeah. Are you from Tasmania? <laughs> right now. 
slavery. It's really hard for Americans to talk about. I think uh, 13, 12 years of slave, 12 years of slave, uh, uh, makes visible the invisible, creates identity and memory. Uh, 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 I think uh, uh, Susan Laurie's Park latest play, Clark's latest play called Father Come Home from the War, you're doing very well. <laughs> And it's also given me hope for the theater. Last night gave me hope for the theater, and I saw the other night an octoroon. Yeah. Right? Oh Extraordinary. Again, makes slavery visible. It's a difficult subject. It's always being forgotten for reasons that are I won't go into. <laughs> but and it's so funny because I thought between an octoroon and then the glory of the world, I thought, oh, American. Um, it, 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 uh, I, I've written in a journal since 
I was about 13 years old, every day it's really dumb. But when I was, um, can I do it by hand? But when I was about 18, I had a friend called the Flea. I don't know why we called her the Flea. She's small. <laughs> she said, she said, Anne, what you should do is you shouldn't write in a journal like what you did. You should write three observations. And so I thought, okay, I'll try that. And it was really hard. So rather than saying, today I went to the bank and then I went to a restaurant, I have to say, I noticed today in front of the bank there's more homeless than there were last year. Do you understand? That, that extra heroic effort every day of actually not just reporting, but of actually developing a point of view. And I realize, and, and I teach this to directors, that it's a director's job to actually develop a point of view. Actors put their heart out, they show you something, and then what's your job is to actually experience it and develop a point of view, which helps them go back in and, and try again. So, so uh, uh, in order to get unstuck, I would question, I would question the words you use, the stories you tell, and, and can you do more than report? Can you actually do the extra effort of developing a point of view? So next in this um, in this little lecturette here of uh, what's the story is where do stories come from? Well, I would ask you: Is there such a thing as a blank page? I would say no. There is no blank page. We're about to do a show the theater is a blank page. <laughs> there is no blank page. Well, I'm starting from the theater, right? There's already isn't a blank page. It, it, a theater has traps, and a theater has ropes, and a theater has doors that go up and down. That is not a blank page. How do you start from what that is? That's what we're trying to do. So what about, I would quote Jasper Johns, the American painter, who said this, how he painted, he said, do some, uh, no, he said, take something, change it, change it again. That was his technique. But there's something, the something exists. Take something, change it, change it again. Now, what I'd like to propose to us as theater people is what is, if it's not a blank page, what do we have? I would propose that we have a rumbling graveyard. This is going to sound morbid, so hang on. Okay? <laughs> I feel that what our job is in the theater is to give voice to dead people. That there are people who didn't finish their sentences, didn't have a chance to finish. And you know, the, uh, the, 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 the no theater from, from Japan used to be in the olden days, it was originally built over graveyards. It was uh, <coughs> stages that were built over graveyards. And the actors would stomp on the stage to raise the spirits of the dead to live through them. Again, this sounds very morbid, but in a sense, we live in a culture that's always saying, be a star, you know, make a lot of money, take a career. It, that is antithetical to what our job is, is to listen to what's coming before. So the blank page is not blank, it's screeching voices that have things they didn't quite finish saying. And it's our job to fill up with them, to study them, and give them voice. And so our voices have to be good, our physical life has to be clear, in order to, to help them speak. It's a very different career than uh, uh, the, the solipsism of, of, of a lonely career, but of actually um, giving voices to dead people. The role of what came before. You know, T.S. Eliot wrote an essay. It's probably the best essay on this subject, and somebody should translate it into English. <laughs> Page. There's a there's a scene in the movie. Of 
Apollo 13. You seen it? Yes. You remember the scene where, okay, so the capsule is out in, in, in trouble out of space, and there's a couple, some guys who go into like a conference room. Remember this? And there's a guy who comes in with a bag of stuff, dumps it on the table, and it's the things that exist in the, in the capsule out of space. It's like a, a, a gaff tape, some socks, literally, some plastic things, tubes. And he says, with these things, we have to bring this capsule back to Earth. I find that a great a, a, a metaphor or analogy for what we do, is that what, with what we have, we put them together in a way that will bring something new. So, so in, the, in, the, in the spirit of telling stories, the question is not looking forward. Certainly, we have to find new ways, as the artists I, I mentioned did, but actually the, the, the material that we're working from, the tools, the shapes, the forms, the, the, the theater has an extraordinary history. How do we use those traps, those ropes, those things that come down, you know, and, 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 and uh, uh, bring, bring something back to Earth in that way. And then lastly, I'll say in this, in this is I heard a, a, an interview with John Mellencamp on NPR with Terry Gross, and he said this amazing phrase, and it's really scary. He said, I own everything I hear. Get the lawyers. <laughs> that whatever you experience in your life becomes a tool and it's yours. As opposed to, I borrowed it or it's, it's, it actually belongs to you. I'll leave you with that thought uh, to go on to the next point uh, uh, next. So we've gone through why tell stories, where stories come from, be cool, you know where they come from now. Okay. <laughs> and the next is how to tell stories effectively. And what I'm about to say, Actually, pretty much everything I say is not original. So that you need three things to tell a good story, in the theater in particular. One, you need technique. Two, you need passion. And three, you need to have something to say. And I think of it like a, a three-legged milk stool. Like if one of, the, one of the legs is missing, the whole thing falls down. So if you have something to say and you have passion, you have no technique, it's not going to work. If you have technique and nothing to say, you, you know where I'm going with this. So in order to tell stories effectively, you need those three things. Secondly, and please forgive me because I've written about this a lot, and I'm going to give you an example that I've written about once, and people seem to remember this, so I'm saying it for you again for those who don't like reading, um, is to be articulate in the face of uncertainty. The reason we don't do things is because we think we don't know. I don't know enough to do anything. But how can you, from a state of not knowing, which is basically all of us, all the time, you never know, but how can you be articulate at that same time? So the example I'm going to give that I've used a lot, but it seems to be something that people like to hear, so forgive me for those who know it, is that when I'm completely lost in rehearsal, and I'm usually on a stool, and when I get lost, I sit. <laughs> I hope I don't sit this way. Uh, <laughs> what I'll do is I'm completely lost. I'll say, I know, and I'll start walking towards the stage. <laughs> Jan Whitehead, who's a, who's a, who wrote a book on
on board, boards, theater boards, and she's like a philosopher. She was our board chair for a while. She wrote a very <coughs> incendiary article in, in American theater a number of years ago, where <coughs> people got really upset about it. She said, we use the wrong words to describe ourselves. For example, and she's talking about the theater in general, she said, not for profit or non-profit. That's a terrible word. Mm -hmm. That's like going up to somebody and saying, hello, I'm non. <laughs> <laughs> and then she went on, and there might be a few people in the room who, <clears throat> for whom you'll relate to this, some of you not yet. She said the words unearned income. <laughs> it's a terrible way. That's the, that is the most earned income you'll ever get. Yeah. 
Street and Sigourney Weaver and all those people. And while he was there, he said, well, you can't have a school of theater without having a theater. So he founded Yale Rep. And it became very well known. And then he was invited, because after 10 years, he could only stay 10 years at, at, at Yale. He was invited by Harvard to uh, start a theater company there. And they gave him a building, the Low Drama Building, much to the chagrin of the undergraduates who had been using it, and they were thrown out. Anyway, he was given this building. He brought his company of actors up from New Haven and started a season. And not long afterwards, and this is a true story, he went into the uh, president of Harvard and he said to the president, we're very grateful to be here. It's wonderful to have ART, the name of the theater, ART, American Repertory Theater. Good name for theater, by the way. But I'd like to start a school for training um, playwrights, directors, and actors, and dramaturgs for uh, uh, advanced training, for graduate training. And the president said, no. We don't do art schools here at Harvard. So Bob was very um, stubborn, came back two months later. But it's okay for the story, right? Comes back to two months later, and he meets with the president again. And he says, We're very appreciative to be here. ART is going very well. The drama center is good. I'd like to start a conservatory for advanced training of actors, directors, playwrights, and drama writers. And the president said, We do not do conservatories here at Harvard University. Obviously goes away, he comes back again sometime later, <laughs> and he says, we're very appreciative to be here. I would like to start an institute for the directors, and playwrights, and the president said, ah, I guess we do institutes. finding the right words. The words are like keys. You don't always have the right key for the right lock, but you'd be amazed to, to know that if you can find the right words to describe what you're doing, the doors will open. Still, under how to tell stories effectively, this might be the most important aspect, is the role of an enthusiasm. It's kind of funny, but it's not. <laughs> yeah. Well, I was at a dinner party once, and I was introduced to a guy who's, uh, I thought he was introduced as an architect, that he was an architect, and I love architecture. I'm sort of an architecture buff, amateur buff. And I ended up sitting next to him, and I, said, I turned to him and I said, oh my god, I'm so impressed. You're an architect. How wonderful the field is so exciting, and I named all my favorite architects. And, he looked kind of embarrassed, and he said, uh, I'm not an architect anymore. <laughs> I said, oh, I'm so sorry. I thought you were an architect. He said I was, but I, I, the, all those people that you mentioned, I lack something they all have. And I said, what? And he said, enthusiasm. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and I thought about it, and it's, it's actually key. Um, if you look at the word enthusiasm, means, etymologically, it means to be filled with God and the Theo. That uh, people who commission buildings are paid millions of dollars normally for a building, but they're not going to give that money to somebody who does not have a love of the art form, who doesn't speak about it passionately, or if you can't speak, it's not always about speaking, it's about, as Wittgenstein says, if you can't say it, point to it. And he goes on to say, if you can't point to it, Sweat it. If you can't sweat it, piss it. I don't know. If there's somebody who's pointing in a direction and saying, this is, this is the way to go, that without enthusiasm, there's no there there, as Gertrude Stein said about Oakland, California. <laughs>
in your lives and in your relationship to the art form that you're working in. And it's your job to cultivate that enthusiasm because without it, there's no legs and feet. Uh, finally,
And I said, yes. <laughs> and he said, a man, a great maker of violins, was very much in love with his wife. His wife died in child childbirth. He was bereft. He took a violin that he was working on and he painted it with her blood. And as he's telling me the story, I noticed that he's looking at me, seeing if I'm getting it or not, or what how it and he starts to describe the, the journey of this violin, maybe some of you are getting which film this is, through, <coughs> through continents, through uh, 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 centuries. And I, I'm sitting there thinking, I'm the luckiest person in the world. This is an amazing story. And this is the film that later became a red, a red violin. If you haven't seen it, you should see it. Netflix. <laughs> what I realized later is that there was nothing special about me. I thought I was really special. He thought I was cool and wanted to tell his story. I think he would have turned to whoever was sitting next to him and said, can I tell you the story of my next film? He was working. And I believe that his film got made because he turned to me. Not because I had any money to give him, but because of that impulse was part of a ladder towards getting his, his project done. That, that impulse, it goes back to the heroism of storytelling, that impulse to tell the story is what actually helps to, <clears throat> to fundraise. And I'm a big believer in not letting always the administration do the fundraising for, uh, uh, for a theater company. In other words, it's the artist who should walk into the rooms <clears throat> with foundations, with potential donors, and you start to talk your uh, your project into existence, they become partners in a real way because they become involved. You get that point? Okay. <laughs> Moving on. Well, I'm going to shorten this one. This is the politics of rehearsal. We talked a little bit about the words you use. I would just say that. <clears throat> and it was a great example of the glory of the world last night to see, is that the theater is always about one thing, and it's what distinguishes it from any other art form. The theater is always about social systems, meaning how are we getting along? How, how, are, the, how are the characters getting along? No other art form uses that as their essential uh, material. Certainly not dance, certainly not visual art, but the theater is always asking this question. So every play asks this question, how are we getting along? So Oedipus killed his father, slept with his mother, there's a problem. So if a play starts, <laughs> a play starts always when something goes wrong, the pendulum is strong. And the rest of the play is to see that social system, that system or that family, which is a social system, try to regain balance from a state of imbalance. That's what happens in a play. Now, what I want to propose to you, hang on to your hats, is that when an audience sees a play, they actually are seeing two plays. They're seeing the story of Oedipus meeting his fate. But they're also seeing the story of the actors on the stage and how they're getting along. In other words, when we saw the glory of the world last night, how do you think those guys got along? <laughs> Can you feel it? You know, you can't really hide bad rehearsal process in a performance. You just can't. So our job is to create the kind of rehearsal room in which a society that you can believe in can, take, can happen. You follow me? So, so every time there's a, 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 the event of theater, there are a number of things going on. There's two stories happening. There's the story of the play. There's the story that the audience is getting about the actors and those of that group. That's, one of the, that, that's not happening in the front prefrontal cortex of the brain. That's happening in ancient parts of the brain. So those two are happening. There's also, um, there's also the question, how are the actors getting along? How is the audience getting along? How are the actors and the audience getting along? That's in the room. That's the subject of the theater. That's why it was so exciting last night, because stuff was happening. That's the stuff that we lose when we're not in the theater. And that's the stuff that has to be uh, uh, celebrated. So what I would just say is, uh, in two minutes, okay, uh, uh, create the world you want to live in in the rehearsal space. It's, it's 
a revolution in, in small rooms that make bigger rooms possible. In other words, I don't think a chorus line would have happened if Joe Chaikin in the open theater hadn't done these small pieces. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. That Michael Bennett saw those pieces and, and it, 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 it goes out into the world. Finally, the audience's role in telling the story. I mentioned before, we don't remember facts. You can't change anybody's political view by telling them facts. You only change it through emotion. I have, I have a friend, Barney's and my mutual friend, Henry Stram, wonderful actor. He was, uh, he was in uh, Major Barbara. George Bernard Shaw. Yeah! Yeah! <laughs> in, at, 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 at Center Stage in, in, in Baltimore a number of years ago, and he was playing Cousins, which isn't the main role. And he told me that one Sunday afternoon, matinee performance, what we call the, the rinse, rinse heads? No, what do we so it was a, it was a bad day. <laughs> and I have to read this because he misspoke a line in late in the play. And he was supposed to say, My mother is my father's deceased wife's sister, and in this island I am consequently a foundling. That was his this is like afternoon Sunday. <laughs> I am consequently a founding, foundling. He made a mistake, he flubbed, and instead he said, my father is my brother's deceased wife's sister, and in this island I am consequently a foundling. <laughs> <laughs> messed up, right? He said, the most amazing thing that happened, when he messed up, the entire audience went, <gasps>